say thank you for being here and appreciate those of you that are able to be here during the uh, revival. I feel like that revival was a great blessing to us and I feel like many people were strengthened and many were encouraged during revival. I woke up this morning, spent some time praying, asking the Lord to just continue to let revival just continue to flow through each and every life. Hopefully, any commitments that we've made during revival, anything we've said, Lord, we'll do this or we'll do that or we're going to change some things, hopefully we stick with that. Amen. Thank you, Miranda. And I'll tell you this morning, the thing is, is that uh, revival, as revival goes and revival comes and it, it leaves, if you will, uh, one of the greatest tests of real revival is how revival lasts. That's right. And uh, they have often, I can tell you, I used to evangelize myself doing what uh, Brother Hanks has done, preaching revivals in a lot of places. And we've been in many different states. We've been all over the state of Florida preaching. And uh, one of the common consensus among many of the evangelists was this. One of the hardest services... Uh, when it comes to revival, one of the hardest services is the day after revival, or the next service after revival. And uh, we've never understood that, but a lot of times it was that way. But, uh, but I'm thankful for revival. I feel like the Lord touched me in many ways, helped me in many different ways, and so, so thankful uh, for all that God did for the Myers family. I feel like the Lord really touched my wife. I mean, to tell you, she's even treating me better. Y'all wouldn't believe it. It's wonderful. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But uh, I even got her to laugh. Praise the Lord. But, but anyway, but it is always a wonderful thing to be able to be in God's house. I, you know, I hope we never take for granted what a privilege that it is. There are countries like China and different places where that uh, because of the system of the government that uh, people just can't worship as freely and easily as we can here. And uh, I've often wondered if, if people really have taken it for granted. I guarantee you there's a lot of people over in China who really love the Lord, who are Christians, and many of them that have been, they've been beaten, they've been ostracized by their communities. They would love anything to be able to go to revivals and to be able to be in churches like we are. I guarantee you that. As many of them, they have to go underground, they have to, uh, they have, to have church in secret. They can't do like we do, many of them. So I think it's a privilege, don't you? I'm, I'm thankful to be an American. A lot of things in America that seem like they're changing and going in the wrong direction uh, as far as the uh, political uh, realm and such as that. Most of you know uh, I try not to be very political from the, from the pulpit, uh, but I do have conservative values, and those conservative values are a part of our product, a byproduct of the Word of God. And I've often told people, they come to me and say, you know, well, what or who should I vote for? 
and uh, I'm of the mind. I don't mind telling people who I'm going to vote for. I'm, I'm not scared to do that. But typically what I'll tell somebody, if, uh, if they ask me, so who should I vote for? Uh, I'll tell them right off the cuff. Vote for your values. Vote for your convictions. If you have convictions, vote for those convictions. Uh, when you go to the polls and you find out that somebody stands for abortion and, and uh, homosexual lifestyles and, and a lot of other Planned Parenthood and all these other supportive things and just foolishness, when you, when you start seeing that, you know, you've got to really take in that, that in consideration. So that's about as political as you'll hear me get, but I'm thankful to be an American uh, in the respect that we have the freedom for as long as we have it. I know that in the world we live in today, that many of our liberal uh, leaders are doing everything in their power to sway things in, in such a favor that they can silence the church and tell the church what and when and how they can do what they're going to do. Uh, but I'm thankful that as of right now, I don't have to worry about it. I can walk into this sanctuary. I can praise the Lord. I can lift my hands. I can park my car outside. I don't have to worry about the Apocalypse Police Department rolling by and seeing me here. And uh, I hope that we never have a day when our great-grandchildren or any of our uh, extended family in any way or even in, in a generation nearer to us and ever have to go through such a thing as that. We'll always have the, the liberties that many of our uh, wonderful soldiers gave their lives for and shed their blood for. There's been a lot of blood that has been uh, spilled, if you will, or a lot of blood that has been uh, shed for the freedom that we have. And how many of you are thankful for that? Here we are. We're at a, we're at a great weekend, uh, Labor Day weekend, I think they call it, and so uh, a lot of folks may be on vacation, so I don't know who will be here and what plans people have. But I'll tell you a little bit about me and Sister Myers, and now whether you want to know this or not, we, you're going to have to hear it anyway for the next few minutes. But, uh, but this is kind of how we are uh, in the past, and my wife can, can vouch for this, but anytime we went off, we haven't, got, we haven't had very many vacations uh, in our time of being married. Matter of fact, we never even really had a honeymoon uh, but we've had a couple of times when we've got off, and usually when we go on vacation, it turns into a preachcation. What do you mean by that? If somebody finds out we're going to be in Tennessee or we're going to be in Georgia or we're going to be somewhere as well, can y'all preach for us while we're here? That's what it usually turns into. And uh, so we haven't had a lot of times where we got off, but any time we've ever gone anywhere, one of the first things we look for when we go off somewhere, we want to know, okay, where's the nearest church? Because if we're going to be out and it's going to be a Sunday or whatever or time we can be in church, we want to try to be in church when we can. You say, well, that's kind of foolish. No, I just believe in being faithful to the Lord. And I've always thought to myself, man, if a rapture were to take place, the last place I want to be is outside if I, if I could be where I can be. You know what I mean? Here, here in the last few months, I know that a lot of things have been uh, speculative because we've had so much going on and uncertainty with the virus but I'm talking about in general. Over the years that we've been in ministry, we've always tried to make sure if we went off somewhere, we were going to make sure we were in church. It might be we tried to find the best church close by there we could, and we've been in the house of the Lord. Like I said, we usually end up preaching there. But yeah. So uh, but do keep us in prayer this month because uh, there was a, a scheduled time that I was supposed to preach revival up in Live Oak at, uh, near the end of this month, and right now... Uh, with everything that's been going on, so many different people have been affected in so many different ways. I'm not 100% certain uh, whether we will be there or what we'll be doing just yet. But either way, I want God's will. And He knows exactly when to come. I spoke to Brother Tim Baggett uh, the other day, and uh, he thanked me for all the good folks here at Gray Street who were kind enough to uh, uh, have you know confidence in them to help them to get insurance, and I am just thrilled to death as pastor to know that he has been able to help so many people. I've had a lot of great reports, and uh, most of you know whenever we went to get the insurance, I told everybody, I said, just so you know, this is just something that I felt inspired of the Lord to do, and I reached out to Brother Timmy. He never called me. He never asked me to do anything. And uh, I, there was no intention of any kind of kickback or me getting anything out of anything at all other than knowing our people were going to be blessed. When I talked to him on the phone the other day, he said, Brother Myers, can I get y'all's address? 
uh, for the church here. And I, I said, sure. So uh, I gave him our address. And he said, I just wanted you to know that uh, our insurance agency is going to be sending a check to Grace Street Church for $500. He said, just as a token of our appreciation of the faithful people in the church. So, you know, like I said, we never even, I never had any idea that that would happen. Uh, but praise the Lord. It was a win-win situation all the way around. And I'm just thankful to know uh, that all the way around, the church is going to be blessed. And I tell you, we could use it, and uh, but I'm so thankful to know that the Lord's provided that. He's made a way, made it possible uh, for us to be able to do that. And also, if you have any other family, people that you know of, or you work with somebody who's in need of insurance and that kind of thing, uh, you know we don't we don't get up here and advocate businesses and such as that. But if you know anybody that could be blessed in any way, you make sure and let me know. Or you, if you got uh, Brother Tim's phone number, you can reach out to him. Let him know uh, that you got somebody that is in need. Because I tell you what, we got a lot of folks that have been sick, a lot of people getting up in age, and they really, really could use the benefit of being able, when they need to, to go to the doctor. And I've had a lot of good reports, even just recently. So thank the Lord for that. Had a good uh, weekend so far. Anybody else had a good time so far this weekend? Uh, right after the Heels of Revival, I was thinking to myself, you know, what are we going to do uh, this weekend? Uh, I've been working on cars, it seems like, every day. I told my wife, I said, I think I should have just went ahead and became a mechanic. I worked on my son's car, worked on my truck, I worked on my daughter's van the other day. I've changed oil in about five or six vehicles. I said I should have just become a mechanic. But yesterday, we got a little uh, break away, and... Uh, Captain Ivy took us all the way over to Eustace from uh, from where they live at near Nastatula on the on the uh, Ivy Express boat and uh, chauffeured us over there. We had a good time and uh, it was a wonderful experience. We had a good time. I don't get to get out very often, and so and my wife just absolutely loves the water. And I, I love the water too, but I think that she loves the water about ten times more than I do. So it don't take very much. She just sees the water moving around and she's already on cloud nine. So, amen. It has been wonderful. And uh, I've been looking forward to this morning's service. I told you probably this last week during the revival, I said, boy, you folks are in for it. Because all during the revival, I could tell the Lord was helping me. Because just about every night, God was giving me another message. I said, boy, we're coming in Sunday morning, Sister Rachel. We're going to come in with both barrels loaded. We're going to have church this morning. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, Friday night, if you were here Friday night, you you probably noticed my wife was not here and my daughter-in-law was not here. And uh, but I'm thankful she seems to be doing a little bit better tonight. My little chicken nugget, and uh, so thankful for the Lord blessing her the way He has. But boy, this pregnancy, you know, this is our first time, and I don't know if that's why, but she got so sick she had to go to the hospital. And my wife is with her Friday night, and uh, but I do appreciate my wife for you know always being there. She wanted to be here bad, but uh, but she also wanted to be there with my daughter-in-law, and I think that it was necessary. So she's here this morning, and I believe the Lord's going to use both of them in this service to be a great blessing. If this is your first time ever being at Grace Street, or you say, Pastor, I'm just thankful to be here, let me encourage you to do something. Just take the brakes off, get in this service. Don't let anything distract you or hinder you. I know when we look around, we see a lot of people uh, that normally would be here. Maybe it's because it's Labor Day weekend and they're not here. But I can guarantee you this much. When I got up this morning, I wanted to worship the Lord if nobody showed up. I wanted to give God praise that there wasn't but five or ten or a hundred or fifteen. As long as I've been pastoring here, twelve plus years, going on thirteen years, I've seen this place where there wasn't but three, four, five people in here. And I've seen it before where it was packed in here where wasn't hardly nowhere to sit at before. And to me, it didn't make no difference just to Benefield if it was a packed house or was a handful. Most of you know I preach the same no matter what. It, it doesn't make any difference. We're going to have church, and I'm going to lift up several needs this morning in prayer. I had someone that reached out to me uh, as an old family friend. My mom knows uh, the, the uh, lady very well. Her name is Jeanette Locke, but she reached out to me in a private message, and I always try to make sure... That's one of the worst things in the world to me. I guess it's a pet peeve. I, I can't stand it when people say, pray for me. And somebody goes, oh, yeah, well, we'll pray for you. And then they never do. And uh, But she reached out to me, and there's a gentleman. I think his name is Denver. I think is what she said his name was. 
and uh, sent me a couple pictures of him. He's laying in the hospital in a coma. Got tubes coming in and out of his body. And if you've ever had a family member that was in a shape like that, that's a, that's a terrible place and a feeling uh, to see somebody like that. And she said, please keep him in prayer. And I told her that our church would be praying for him. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to lift him up in prayer and remember that the Lord will touch him in his body. Sister Benefield. Uh, I know y'all know her, but uh, Joyce Hagel's husband is in bad shape. Don? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I know very well. And in intensive care. And she just lost her son. And then she had a hip replacement. And now this. She's, she's just going. She's coming in waves. Yeah, we've known them a long time. They were actually going to Okoy whenever my wife and I got saved and started going to church there. And uh, so we've known them many, many years. Matter of fact, I don't know if you've heard her sing in a while, but back in the day, they all used to sing, had their own little group. Faye would sing with them. She's passed on now. Bonnie would play the, the piano. She's passed on now. And uh, also, uh, they, uh, forget Faye's husband. He's kind of a heavy set fellow. Just a really super nice guy. Uh, but they all sang together. We do remember them uh, this morning. They could use our prayers uh, they're wonderful people. They always treated He's me and Sister Myers. Care. Huh? He's in intensive care. That's terrible. I hate to hear that. They always treated us, I mean, just wonderful. And every time she seen me, she had the biggest smile on her face and just so excited to see we went on her ministry. I was real young, too. <laughs> yes, ma'am. All right. Is there anybody else you can think of? I want you to remember the Gaskins family. I remember Sister Gaskins and Brother Gaskins. Many of you that have been with us for a while, you remember her son Nathan for a long time. There he went to church with us. He even worked for me uh, in our business for a little while. And uh, most of you already know, it's no secret, but poor Nathan, he's got himself messed up in, in drugs and different things. And in the last few years of his life has just been a terrible downhill spiral. And uh, in, with tears in her eyes the other night, Sister Cindy said, would you please... Uh, pray for Nathan, said he just got out of jail or a rehab or something, said he's got him a job at some place, and uh, she's really hoping the best. And she said, Nathan asked me to ask Pastor Myers to pray for him. And I said, well, you tell him I love him, and I'm going to be praying that the Lord will help him. So you remember Nathan, continue to remember Sister Cindy. It was good seeing her, you know, during the revival. She's had many health issues that many of you know about. Her last surgery she went into, she came out, she couldn't even hear out of one of her ears. And that surgery they did didn't have anything to do with her ears at all. So we just don't understand that. But like I told you in preaching here a while back, and you seen it for yourself, I said with all that she's lost, her job, her car, her driver's license, her home, they lost the home to foreclosure. She's lost several things health-wise. Man, now lost hearing in one of her ears. I, but like I said here a while back, I called her on the phone, and I said, Sister Cindy, do you still love the Lord? Do you still want to serve Him? I guarantee you she'd say yes, and you saw it for yourself. But do keep her in your prayers. James will pray it for his niece yeah. up in Alabama. Still bad off. Still bad off. In a yeah. coma, right? And just, no, he ain't going to be. He can't breathe. Okay, can't breathe. So, yeah, uh, bad no, shit. Don't go to hell, we do, but I don't want to die right now. Yes, sir. Well, let's make sure most of all, pray for their soul's salvation. That's the most important thing of all. No insurance. All right. That's no terrible. Insurance. No insurance. Yeah. Well. You're going to pay for insurance, and then you're out of it, it's different, and it's down here. Yeah. You got to pay for about two months, about a year, before you get insurance again. Oh, that's a mess. Let's do keep him in your prayers. Yeah. And then, uh, Sister Misty, any word on how your sister's doing lately? Um, she's okay. She still thinks she has to feed us a little bit. Um, they, now the surgeon wants her to lose 20, 20 pounds. And she, she doesn't know how she can do it. She's on a strict diet, the dialysis. She, it's just one thing after another. She does, she, she's really frustrated. So just keep her in prayer. Yeah. And then And she has both of her kids removed, right? Correct. Yeah, she called me yesterday and asked me to keep her in prayer. She doesn't know what to do next. It breaks my heart to hear yeah. that she's going through all that. I can only imagine the frustration and yeah. 
It was good to see your dad during the yeah. revival, and I could see during all the service he was smiling and looked like he was happy. Yeah. And so uh, okay. that was wonderful. That was wonderful. I don't know why, but the silk rocks are on my heart tonight. Yeah. All right. I haven't heard anything from them, but they're on my heart, so I thought I'd request prayer for them. Yes, sir. I do you remember, brother and sister, Sufran? That's what I could remember, Dad. I'm not feeling well. Also, my sister law and Amen. I was praying for her this morning when I got up for prayer. Sister Linda. Benefield. Also remember Brother Eric. Most of you know if, uh, if there's church, Brother Eric is here. And if you don't see him, you know something going on. Brother Eric's got something going on with his foot again. It's been an on again, off again uh, love affair with that foot. Something just terrible. And uh, he, he really needs the Lord to touch his foot. And we're going to pray for that end. I know Brother Eric loves the Lord. And he tries to watch the services whenever he can't be here. Uh, but uh, he has been uh, He's been going through it, from what I understand, with his foot. And with that diabetes is a product of that is what that's from. And so but do keep him in your prayer as far as that is concerned. And uh, when you look around this morning, I know there's some people that are not here just because of holiday or maybe other different reasons. There are some people that have not been in church in a long time uh, because they just kind of fell by the wayside and, and uh, just they're not really serving the Lord at all. And that always concerns me, especially when it's family and people... Uh, that we've known for so long and such as that. And want to keep them in prayer this morning. So if uh, you know someone, maybe it's a, a loved one or maybe someone you haven't seen in a long time, we're going to be lifting them up in prayer, asking the Lord to just, uh, you know, go out there and throw that fishing pole in the, in the water and reel it in. We, we're ready to see it come back home. So uh, let's be praying for them this morning as well. I believe God can do it. I don't think it has to be, you know, 2022 before we see Him get saved and uh, serve the Lord. I have been diligently uh, praying for my lost family. How about you? Anybody been doing that lately? I've been, I'm just, every day, I'm asking the Lord. And uh, it may sound repetitious at times, but it doesn't make any difference to me. He said, pray without ceasing. And that's what I'm doing. I'm going to keep on asking the Lord. Every day I'm asking the God, uh, God that whatever it takes, if it's uh, some level of conviction or something has to happen. And uh, many of you may remember that during the revival that I shared with you, that two different occasions the Lord spoke to me this past week, and He said these words, look for strange things. And that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Whether it's in the next week, the next six months, I just know this, that just like you see in the Word of God, there were events in the Bible that would have been strange things. Matter of fact, I preached a message several years ago on strange things. You remember one place they said, we have seen strange things today. What does that mean, Pastor Myers? That means that God does not always move in what looks like the expected norm. Sometimes He moves in ways that are just completely beyond our comprehension. And I'm going to look for God to do that. doesn't matter to me how He moves as long as He does. you feel the same way I do about that? 
How about we stand our feet this morning, get ready to ask the Lord to just be with us in this service. And I uh, want you to just make yourself right at home, but I want you to jump in this service and praise the Lord and worship Him with everything that's within you. Let's begin to pray and ask God to have His way. Lord, this morning, we're ever so grateful and thankful, God, for this great privilege to be the bride of Christ, the called out, the chosen, those that you have ransomed by your own blood. And I pray this morning, God, that you will overshadow us with your presence and with your power and your mercy to be in this place today. Lord, there are many different souls that have been mentioned this morning. Some of them that haven't been in church in a while. Some that have kind of gone astray. And I pray, God, this morning that you will bring conviction in their life, God, and deal with their heart, God, to serve you with all of their heart, soul, mind, strength, and body. Lord, there are those this morning that are sick in their body. They've been afflicted by sickness and other things. And I pray, God, this morning for their physical touch from the Lord. And I pray, God, that you will just lay your hand upon every need this morning. On Sister Misty's sister this morning. Upon the situation she has without either kidney in her body and other complications. We pray for divine healing. And I pray, God, minister to her this morning in Jesus' name. And we pray, God, for Brother Benefield's surgery procedure Wednesday coming up. That everything that the doctors do, God, they'll do exactly, precisely what needs to be done. And everything will go smoothly. And you'll have a quick healing and recovery in the name of Jesus. And we, we pray this morning, God, for the Sufrant family. God, you know what's going on and what their needs are. We trust you that you're going to minister to their every need, God, this morning. And the Gaskins family. Specifically this morning, we're praying for Brother Nathan. Lord, we pray by faith that he'll give his life to you and yes, serve Jesus. you with all of his heart, God. And that, Lord, that the drugs that may appeal to him, God, that you'll just take the craving completely out of his, his body. And we pray, God, for divine intervention in the mighty name of Jesus. And this morning, Lord, for every family this morning that is going through a time of financial difficulty and struggle within the home, I pray, God, for their strength and help. In the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we believe you, Lord, for healing right now for this little baby. Our little niece that was born just, for, just the other day that's having trouble breathing. God, I pray that you'll divinely heal this baby in Jesus' name. And I pray, God, that you'll touch Mrs. White that Sister Linda has mentioned this morning. I'm believing you, Lord, to touch her and her body. Lord, fighting with what I understand, maybe COPD, working five and a half days during the week. But I know, God, you're able to change things around and make a way where there seems to be no way. And I pray, God, that you'll touch James's family relative in Alabama, Lord, that you can minister there, healing and the touch of God in Jesus' name. Lord, every need that's represented in this house, we bring to you, we trust you to meet every need, God. Touch this service, let revival linger in this place, and we're going to give you praise for every good thing, and everyone can say amen. Amen. Maybe you can wave at somebody across the room and say, I'd let them know you're glad to see you. Amen. Lord, I don't have a drum player, so y'all just pretend like y'all hear drums. It will be good. My son is sick this morning, not feeling well, so we want to lift up Devin in prayer uh, this morning. We're going to sing an old song. This is when my name is called in glory. And uh, I think a lot of times we may kind of get away from the idea that the Lord is soon to return. Amen. Everything, every problem going on all around us, uh, we may not even make it to that November election. We may not know what uh, 2021 is going to hold unless we're not ready. But I want to be ready. I want to go home to be with the Lord when it's my time. I have heard the call of Jesus and I'm on my journey home. I have left the hearts of sorrow and despair. I am walking with the righteous and I fear no more to run. I am seeking now that country pride and fear. And when my name is called in glory, I'll be there. Yes. For the Lord has heard and answered every prayer. And with Him I made it right, justified for this time. When my name is called in glory, I'll be there. Earth 
sea charm so long to tempt me for in him I stand complete and I'm trying to eat up by his side oh my heavy trial baby he is everything he to me oh he is the soul's true helper friend and died and when my name is called in glory I'll be there for the Lord has heard and answered every prayer And this can I made it right Just as my beginning is God When my name is called in glory I'll be there Leaving earthly cares behind me I am sure to reach the goal And from my Redeemer I will never stray I am on my way to Beulah land, sweet homeland of the soul, where the trials of this life have passed away. And when my name is called in glory, I'll be there. And with him I may ride, right, just the part of his side. When my name is called in glory, I'll be Oh, when my name is called in glory, I'm going to be there. Yes. For the Lord has turned into every prayer. And with him I made it right, just as Father then is not. When my name is called in glory, I'll be there. I have heard the call of Jesus, and I'm on my journey home. I have left the haunts of sorrow and despair. And I am walking with the righteous, and I care no more to wrong. I am seeking now that one true God in there. And when my name is called in glory, I'll be there. For the Lord has heard and answered in a prayer. And with him I pay your just as Father in his sight. When my name is called in glory, I'll be there. How many of you feel that way this morning? Praise the Lord. Amen. I need all the help I can get this morning. I already woke up this morning feeling a little bit of hoarse, but praise God. We're going to sing for the glory of God. This is an older song as well. One more river to cross. One more mountain to climb. I just felt like singing this morning. Some of you have to re be reminded that uh, we're going to face trials. We're going to have some junk come up and the devil's going to poke his head up and he's going to get aggravated, frustrate you, tell you stuff that you don't want to hear. Give me here, nag you to death. You're going to have problems, but one thing about it, if you got your made up, my mind made up, you're going to make it. And you're going to press through. And what we have to remember is it may be one more day, one more mile, one more river to cross, one more mountain to climb, and it won't be long. We'll be home to be with the Lord. Had a little troubles and trials in my little life span. Long and the battle gets hot. I always do the best I can. Must have crossed a million valleys. Must have shed a million tears. But when I come to the river of Jordan, hallelujah, then I'll have no fears. Then I'll have no fears. One more river to cross. One more mountain to climb. One more valley that I gotta go through, leaving my troubles behind. One more battle with the devil, I know he'll understand. I'm going through with Jesus, hallelujah. Been a lot of people talked about me since I've been on the narrow way. Just another little valley came through it. I came through it when I prayed. Climbed a lot of high mountains. Crossed a lot of little streams. See, old Jordan, cold and dark. That'll be the last for me. Oh, that'll be the last for me. Cause I've got one more river to cross. One more mountain to climb. One more valley that I gotta go through. I'm leaving my trouble behind. One more battle with the devil. No, he'll understand. I'm going 
going through with Jesus, hallelujah. I'll be holding to his nail scarred hand. Oh, I've got one more river to cross. One more mountain to climb. One more mountain that I gotta go through. Leaving my troubles behind. One more battle with the devil. No one understands. I'm going through with Jesus. Hallelujah. To his nail star hand. I'll be holding to his nail star hand. Amen. Amen. Miranda's getting ready to sing a song for you here in just a second while she's getting ready to sing. Man, I want to give my wife a chance to testify. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Uh, I thank the Lord for revival this week. The Lord has stirred my soul and touched and helped me. And I was telling Brother Hanks on, uh, it must have been Thursday night, I got all ready for church and got, got about to walk out the door. Pastor had told me before I laid down for a nap after work that um, he needed me to iron a shirt, run over a shirt for him. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. And I was trying to go to sleep. At the, right as soon as I went to walk out the door, um, he said, babe, will you turn the iron on for me? Well, he'll do it himself, you know, but I wanted to iron it for him. So I go in there, and I'm struggling with the iron because it's not hot yet, and it's not, you know, iron through, and I'm getting frustrated. And he's like, babe, I told you I, could, I would do it. I said, no, I wouldn't do it. So finally, after I was almost done fighting with it, the steam came on. Got hot enough. And boy, I just pushed that thing, and all of them just rolled right on out. And I said, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, you just needed your helper. You just waited on waiting on your helper. I got to thinking about how in my life, I just need him there for me. I just need that helper. I just need to wait on him to help me get through things in life. You know, it might be a little simple thing, but it made me think spiritually. You know, when we need to be plugged into the power source, we got to get plugged in. We got to use the effort to get plugged into that place. And I'm thankful to the Lord for helping me this week and touching me and reviving me. I wanted to be revived this week, and he has stirred my soul. Amen. Amen. Preach, girl. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Give her a hand and let her know you appreciate it. I'm going to sing for the Lord this morning before you have to listen to your big mouth, mouth pastor this morning. There is a blood that calls life that paid my
the Lord. We're going to get ready and receive our morning tithes and offerings, so if you have your tithes or offering you'd like to give, get ready to give that this morning. Those of you that may be at home or you may be watching online, if you'd like to uh, contribute anything, I just follow the link on our broadcast, the uh, church website. And on the uh, front page of the website, you can give right there to the online portals through uh, PayPal and through Square, two different options there. And then also, um, we have the Square machine in the back of the church. I've begun to notice that it um, seems like people really uh, like to do it that way, through Square machine. So, appreciate all of you that are contributors, partic participators, I guess you say, and uh, the kingdom work through offering and through tithes. If you have tithes this morning, that 10% that God has uh, asked us to give into the ministry. So uh, as we get ready to pray over the offering this morning, I want you to ask the Lord what he would have you to give this morning. If there's anything uh, that God speaks to you, I want you to be obedient in that area. All right? And as soon as I'm done praying, if you will, just uh, grab your offering and uh, bring it on up here and put it in the pan. And uh, I'll get ready to preach the Word of God to you. Those of you at home online, you can help us pray as well. And we're just going to trust the Lord. He's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. Brother Benefield, will you pray over the offering this morning for us, please? Amen. Thank you for your prayer this morning. Bring your offering on up this morning. If you've already gone by the square machine, well, praise the Lord. Thank you for that as well. And uh, everyone for being a part of what the Lord's doing here at Grace Street. So good to see you in the Lord's house, ready uh, to see and, and experience what the Lord is going to do in your life. If you got something during revival, well, I believe if you really got something, it'll stick with you. It'll stay right there with you. And uh, it ain't going nowhere. He'll continue to strengthen you. And I, I personally feel like I got something. I got something in revival. Anybody else feel like you got anything in revival? Amen. So, so blessed by what the Lord did during this revival. 
so thankful that we were able to have Brother Hanks come and be with us. And many of you know that I look to Brother Hanks in a lot of ways, almost like a, like a pastor over your pastor. And we don't talk all the time, but I'll communicate with him uh, periodically and just let him know, hey, I need you to pray for me. We need, the, you know, this situation. I need some advice, those kinds of things. So, so thankful for him and his ministry. I want you to keep on praying for Brother Hanks as he goes to different places, preaching in different locations. I mentioned Sister Linda Bauchman the other day uh, in preaching or in exhortation, and uh, Sister Linda Bauchman has recently, from my understanding of what we've read and seen, that she had contracted the coronavirus, and uh, Sister Linda Bauchman's way up in her age from what I understand, and um, I think she's a little bit older than Brother Hanks is. And so for her at her age to get that does concern me, but I know the Lord's hands in it. And I guarantee you one thing, if, the, if Sister Linda were to go home to be with the Lord right now, you're talking about a woman with a lot of jewels in her crown. It's going to be a very celebrated thing because I tell you what, she has been one of the most faithful uh, to contribute into the kingdom of God, used by God, and I'm telling you ways that are just far beyond our comprehension. But do remember her in prayer. It came to my mind And so I want to remember her in prayer. We're going to be turning in our Bible this morning to Luke chapter 12. And we're going to pick up in verse 21, Luke chapter 12, verse 21. I'm not going to ask you to stand. Uh, Just just give me a minute because if you want to stand, you can. Uh, But I want to give you a little bit of pretext uh, understanding before we we jump into the text this morning, give you a better understanding of where we're headed today. A lot of times I'll take a text. And uh, because of the direction God has me going in with the message, I always feel bad because I want to cover all the text thoroughly, uh, but uh, this is what we're going to do this morning to maybe help you just a little bit. Luke chapter 12 and verse number 21. Now, just before that we read our text in verse number 21, some of you may be familiar with this parable that Jesus gives about this rich man who says he's going to tear down his barns and he's going to, uh, you know, build greater. And, uh, you know, he tells his soul, he says, soul, take thine ease. You know, you've got much goods laid up for many years. Anybody remember that parable? Well, our text is going to pick up on the heels of that. But what Jesus had to say about this particular parable and his reasoning for bringing this had a lot of great emphasis on the, on the fact that he wanted to deal with the subject of distractions concerning material possessions. Uh, the reason is, is because you can let your house or your car, or your boat or your business or your things become so important that you take your eyes off the spiritual things. And we see that with this man in this text. And this is not where we're going, but I, I did want you to get this because there's a lot of value here. But we see that with this man in this text because, well, how do you know that, Brother Myers? Well, here's a man who's talking about material possessions. He's talking about his barns and his business and his fields and crops and employees and all of these things. And in the midst of all of that, the man starts talking to his soul about material things. Let me tell you something. As I heard one preacher mention many years ago, you know, the Bible said man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You see, we, th- this soul, this inner man cannot live off of PlayStations and big screen televisions and fancy cars and big, you know, five, six bedroom houses. The soul cannot feast and eat on those things. Now, your flesh man may take pleasure in having enjoyments. How many of you like the idea of being able to drive a nice vehicle? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I want you to know the soul, that inner man, cannot thrive and cannot survive on stuff, on things. Now, you've heard me say probably from the pulpit before, and I still stand by this. I'm not going to tell you that a rich man cannot keep the victory or have the victory. I've known many wealthy people that are some of the most spiritual people that you could meet, but in my ministry and the time that I've been serving the Lord, some of the poorest people I've ever met are sometimes some of the most spiritual people that you'll ever meet. 
And the reason a lot of times it has to do with the fact that their confidence is not in their money because they don't have much of that. Their confidence is not in their house because the roof leaks and they got to pray God allows them to get through until they get the money to fix it. And uh, their vehicle, you understand, and so many things we could go down the list this morning, but their confidence is not it's not in stuff, it's in the one who gave us things. It's the one that created all things. How many of you know that to be true? Have you ever met anybody like that? You understand what I mean? That sometimes, and I don't know, but when I look at America, it seemed like the more America prospered, the more America turned its back on God. If you look at history, and you see when America went through difficult times, many times, when they, when they went through a time of difficulty, you would began to see people crying out to God. They couldn't afford insurance and to go to the doctor, so they had to rely on prayer. And uh, they couldn't rely on the attorney because they couldn't afford one. So they had to pray, God, you work this out. And so it's in those times that we know that sometimes the poorest person can easily be affected spiritually and be strong in the Lord because of their reliance not on stuff, but on the Lord. If you agree, say amen. But you see, we then pick up in verse 21, and this is why I wanted to give you this to help you better understand why that we are picking up here and what Jesus says. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 21, in our text, it says this, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. He said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life. Take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on, the life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Now listen to what he says in verse 24. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? I heard a preacher preach years ago on a message title entitled, Better Than Birds. Praise the Lord. Verse 25, And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? In other words, just by worrying about it, you can't make yourself six foot two. It just don't work like that. If you're four foot three, guess what? You're going to be four foot three. Come on now. In verse 26, if you then not be able to do that thing which is least, why take your thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in, in the field and tomorrow is cast in the oven, how much more will He clothe you? Now listen to this. O ye of how much? Little faith. I don't know about you, but I think He might just, he might just be dealing with a faith issue here. What do you say? So he says, and seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be doubtful in your mind. Boy, that you could preach an entire message about being doubtful in your mind. Anybody ever been there? Well, I just don't know whether God's going to show up in time for this electric bill to get paid. Am I the only one that's ever been a little doubtful in your mind? I don't know what we're going to do. But he goes on to say in verse 30, for all, somebody say all. Say it again, all. All these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that you have need of these things. Ain't that a wonderful thing to know that He knows you need it before you ever even asked for it? Before you ever even had a problem, He said, I knew what you were going through. I knew you needed, I knew you needed a few extra dollars. I knew, knew you needed relief from that pain. And so He says, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after and your Father knoweth you have need of these things. You know what I got out of that? I'd never read it and thought about it before like this. But he said all the nations in the world. I mean, think about the millions and probably billions of people that are in the world. And he said of all the millions of people in this world that are crying out, seeking for all these things, he said God knows you. Little old you. 
I mean, right here in Apopka, Florida, out on here on Gray Street. I mean, we're just a nobody in the middle of nowhere. It seems like just a pebble in the pond. But God said, I know what you need this morning. I feel like He's talking to somebody. But He said in verse 31, But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things, all these things shall be added unto you. Seek God first. God said, I'll take care of the rest. With the Lord's help this morning, I'm going to preach something I've never preached on before. And I'd like to preach to you a message entitled, Faith Without the Details. Faith without the details. Anybody believe God's going to talk to us this morning? I believe God's going to talk to us right out of His heart. Raise your heart and hand before the Lord. Let's begin to pray. Father, this morning we're thankful for another opportunity to preach the Word, to receive the Word. God, I pray that You'll hide the Word of God in every heart. Challenge us with conviction and we're going to praise You for the way You help us. In Jesus' name, and everyone can say Amen. Lift your hand and say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. I don't know if a bug flew by about the time I was inhaling, but I think I breathed something down my throat. Praise the Lord. If it starts flapping its wings, you'll know what happened. <clears throat> he may get anointed while he's down in there. I don't know. Here in a few minutes, he's coming up if that's what it is. Hey, man, you at home, you do, some of y'all thinking, what a wacko preacher. But it's not uncommon for us to consider the details of a serious life decision before we're ready to jump into it. I mean, think about it this morning. Have you ever had a real big decision you were going to make? Maybe it was marriage, or you're about to buy a house, or you're going <coughs> to take a job somewhere. And when you think about it, a serious life decision, sometimes a serious life decision versus maybe what grade of gas you're going to put in your car when you pull up to the pump, you're not as concerned about the gas as you are concerned about the decision you're going to make. I've tried to tell people in the past, you got to really think serious when there are big decisions in your life <laughs> because sometimes uh, those decisions <coughs> are going to affect... <coughs> Uh, hallelujah anyhow. Sometimes those decisions are going to affect many other people. I mean, you know what I mean? In other words, if you and your husband, when your daughter's about 13 years old, you decide you're going to move up to Georgia and you're going you're to take root there and you're going to uh, get a job in Georgia and you're going to live in Georgia. Well, what you may not realize is that it may seem like it only affects you and your husband, but your daughter's going to go to school there and everybody she meets, she may meet her future husband or she may meet a drug dealer there or get herself messed up in things in life. So uh, there, these big decisions that, we, uh, that we're going to make in life, we have to put some thought into them, don't we, sometimes? And, and how many of you are like me sometimes uh, uh, that you really analyze things and you want to make sure you know what you're getting into you want to know the details somebody say I want to know the details I want to know what's about to happen I want to know how it's going to happen and all of those type of things well you know I got to thinking about myself now I've made a lot of big decisions in my life but I got to thinking about some crazy big decisions and for me a crazy big decision would be something like me going up to the mountain somewhere where they got these crazy bungee cords that people get on a thing and a, on a platform and they step off the platform and they plunge with a bungee cord strapped to them and they bounce a few times and, and they laugh and they have a wonderful time. Now to me, that would be a big life decision. How about you? I don't know about you, but I can already tell you that if I was going to jump off some platform with a rubber cord attached to me, I'd want to know some things, wouldn't you? I mean, I kind of smiled about it when the Lord was giving me this this morning. I was sitting at my desk putting my notes together and I thought to myself, I could just see myself standing on the platform looking at the guy beside me. I probably asked this before I even made it to the platform. But I'd be asking things like, uh, has anybody ever died doing this? <laughs> I'd be asking him, is, is, is a cord ever broke before? 
I mean, like, do, how often do you, get, do you change the cord? And how often do you need to change it? And how long has it been since you changed it? Anybody else want to know that? I mean, before you, before you say one, two, three, go, I want to know what's happening on the other end. I need somebody to say, I need some details. You know what I mean? I want to know how long you're going to leave me dangling in the air before you go hoisting me back up. I mean, after I jump and you're going to watch me bounce about 25 times and just leave me there for... 30 minutes or you going to bring me back up because I don't want to be hanging out in the middle of nowhere. I would want to know some details. Anybody else like that with some of the things you go through in life? Well, you know, believe it or not, the truth is we tend to approach many of life's big decisions with the idea that I need to know the details. That's right. This is one of the character traits that Jesus dealt with in our text this morning when he said these words. He said unto his disciples, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. What Jesus was saying to the disciples there was rather than worrying over what am I going to eat? How am I going to get by? What am I going to wear? Where am I going to lay my head to sleep tonight? The Lord was trying to help them to understand rather than you worrying yourself to death over all these little minuscule things, uh, taking thought for your life and having doubts about what's around the corner. But instead of needing to know all the details, uh, He said, just seek the Lord first uh, and put God first and God's going to work out the details. You see, the Lord reminded them that the ravens never go hungry, and they don't have barns, and they don't have a place to put all the food, and they don't grow their own crops, but God makes sure that the ravens of the air, the fowls of the air that God said, I'm taking care of them and making sure they've got something to eat. How much better are you than the birds? Uh, Then He goes on to show us that the lilies that bloom uh, out in the field, they, they bloom and grow unhindered and they bloom greatly. They were even arrayed better than Solomon who had so much wealth and wisdom in his lifetime but God said nobody goes out there and nobody has to wind it up. Nobody has to fertilize or do anything. God said I take care of them and if God takes care of them how much more is the Lord going to take care of you and me? He went on to say that the grass of the field is in a constant state of growth. It's going to grow it's going to get a certain length like the wheat that may grow in the field they're going to come by they're going to cut it down they're going to throw it in the oven and before you know it guess what grass is going to grow back up in the same place again but you don't have to worry about it now do you because God said I make sure that it happens do you know this world spins on a perfect axis scientists and different people have agreed that if the world was just a few degrees off of its axis that the world would spin, the earth I should say would spin into outer space Uh, but I want you to know God precisely put it on the axis that it is on right now and you and I are held down by a gravitational force, amen, compliments of God of heaven, can you say thank the Lord for that aren't you glad God keeps you grounded sometimes, Uh, I'm thankful for the spiritual gravitation pull that God puts in my life to keep me on my feet spiritually speaking but he goes on to say how much more will he clothe ye O ye little of faith he said he can take care of the grass he can take care of the birds he can take care of the flowers and what do you say he can also take care of you anybody else feel like God's proven to him to you that he can take care of you this morning Has God taken care of anybody here this morning? Has God made sure you had a Big Mac and a French fry and a small Coke in the past? Come on, God's made sure you were taken care of. You had a little bit of biscuits and gravy. Maybe you had a day you didn't have a whole lot. I had a family member one time that called me and said, I want you to pray for me. He said, for the last month we have ate eggs every single day. It's been bad. We've been so broke. He said, we just eat eggs every single day. But they did tell me this. 
They say we want to thank the Lord that even though all we've had is eggs, we thank God we had eggs. Uh, let me tell you, when you got an attitude like that, you can believe uh, that before long God's going to give you some grits with your eggs. Uh, or if you're up north, you might like cream of wheat. And God said, hang on. Uh, it might be eggs this week, but God said, I'm going to give you some cream of wheat next week uh, and a side of bacon and some pork sausage uh, or something else to go along with it. Let me tell you this morning, one thing I know about God uh, is that if you'll hang on and trust God, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. And I don't know if you're listening online or you're in this service this morning and you say, I don't know really about what's up ahead of me. I just stepped out of something and into something or I'm about to make some life altering choices and I don't understand or really know what's up ahead. You know this, the same God that provided in the past is the same God who will provide in the future. I had to remind myself when coronavirus came on the scene that we shut down the church for a little while in some regard where the, a lot of people were not coming a lot of the finances were not coming in that once came in and yet we have bills to pay I don't receive a salary from the church I pastor because it's a calling not a, not a career and I do this because I love the Lord but we got bills around this church to pay and I said oh God in the flesh what am I going to do you know what the flesh was saying I need some details God show me how it's going to happen but I just reminded myself uh, brother Bill that in the past I remember times uh, when it was tight as it could be uh, amen like one old preacher said tighter than a tick on a dog's hind leg uh, and I didn't know what in the world we was going to do to make ends meet uh, it was times we was behind and I said how are we going to make up the difference we can barely pay the bills as it is uh, but in that moment I reminded myself the Lord did it before and I'm just going to have to believe that he's going to do it again. Somebody say amen with me here this morning. Uh, but you see, I, I know how it is. Uh, and I know that some of you, uh, that if truth be told, uh, you'd look me right in the whites of the eyes and say, Brother Myers, but I... I need the details. Have you ever felt that way before? I need to know how's this thing going to work out. Am I going to stay sick to the third trial or what a second trimester to whatever you, duo mester or whatever you call it? I'm, I've never been pregnant, y'all can tell. But uh, you know, am I going to be sick like this for a long time? How's it going to work out? Am I going to be in labor for a few hours, or I'm going to just go in labor and have the baby on the couch in the living room? I need some details. God. You see, sometimes we are just like that, and I know that's how we are. But do you remember what he told him in verse 29, 30, and 31? He said, And seek not what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, neither be doubtful in mind or of mind. In other words, don't you start questioning God, worrying and doubting God. God said, I got this. I've had it in the past. And unless you take it out of my hands, I still got it. Come on. I came to preach to you this morning. He said in verse 30, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that you have need of these things, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. There you are. You put your key in your pocket. You get dressed. Uh, you go out to the car, pull the keys out of your pocket, stick them in the ignition, and you barely got gas to get to work this week, uh, but you're headed to the house of God. Uh, and the devil said, now, how are you going to make it? said, I don't know, uh, but I'm not going to seek after these things. Uh, I don't got to have any details. Uh, I'm just going to trust God that he knows how to make it happen. Uh, and listen, uh, if I run out of gas on the side of the road, I'm just going to call Pastor Myers anyway. Praise the Lord. Come on, somebody. How many of you know that we should love the Lord enough uh, that we have that kind of faith that God is going to work out the details? Uh, but why do we want the details? Uh, you know the reason you and I want the details, uh, Sister Rachel, because the details tell us the when. Uh, the when that it's going to happen. When is that money going to show up? When's the Social Security check going to come in? Uh, the details tell us the where. Uh, where's it going to be? Is it going to be in the mailbox or the 
they going to mail it to me? Have I got to go down to the place and pick it up? Where is it going to happen? The details tell us the how. How's it going to happen? Uh, this person's going to sign it over. They're going to send you to this website. You're going to fill out an application. And when that's done, uh, this person's going to send it to that person. And they're going to cut a check. And so and so's going to mail it to you. Wouldn't it be nice if life was like that? And the Lord just told you every detail of everything. Uh, but let me tell you, that's not how God operates. Uh, we want to know the details. We want to know the how, the when, the why, and the what. Uh, the details give us the reassurance uh, that it is safe for us to proceed. Uh, when you know the details, it makes you feel better about taking a step of faith. Uh, do you remember Peter when he was on the boat uh, and he looked out one night on the third watch and he saw Jesus walking on the water and he said, Lord, is that you? Uh, and the Lord, it was the Lord. Uh, and, the, and he said, uh, if it be thou me on the water bid me to come to you on the water and Jesus said come to me Peter and you know what Peter could have looked at the water and he could have looked at Jesus and he could have done like my mom did yesterday when she asked my dad or my wife somebody said how deep do you think this water is and my dad said oh, I'm probably about seven feet deep my mom said no it can't be seven foot deep if he'd have said eight foot deep, she'd have probably said it couldn't be eight foot deep. She'd have said it 45 foot deep. She'd have probably, I love you, mama. But you know, Peter could have asked a lot of questions. Uh, he could have said, I need to know some things before I step over the bow. Now, how far is it from the bow to the water's edge? Uh, how deep is the water? How cold is that water? How rough is that water? He didn't have hardly any details at all. All he knew uh, is that Jesus was on the water and he wanted to go where Jesus is at. Man, that tells me something, Sister Misty. There are going to be some places of our life and you might be about to face something that you didn't anticipate was going to come and you're going to remember me preaching this message you may be about to lose a job you may be about to lose a big income you may be about to go through something and some of you are sitting there going Lord God I hope he's not a prophet this morning but let me tell you something folk you might be about to go through something that completely rocks your world but I'll tell you what you do you just put that seat belt on on, uh, put your tray in an upright position and hold on for turbulence uh, because the same one that brought us through to this point is the one that can carry us on through. Uh, I heard a man say many years ago, uh, he said, I do a lot of flying on airplanes. Uh, and he said, there's one thing that I do. Uh, he said, a lot of people that don't fly often, uh, he said, they go through turbulence. Uh, and he said, the first thing they do, you look on their face uh, and they get nervous. They get scared because they don't know how how bad it's going to get uh, when the airplane pilot says uh, hey man put your tray in an upright position everybody sit down we're about to go through some turbulence uh, he said while everybody else is freaking out uh, he said I'm just sitting there not minding my minding anything uh, he said doing whatever I normally do uh, and he said one day somebody looked at me uh, and they said now how can you be so calm uh, didn't you just hear him say we're about to face some turbulence uh, he said because there's one thing that I do. He said any time that I can get my eyes on the pilot. He said I watch the pilot. He said because if the pilot looks calm he said then I don't worry. He said when that pilot looks nervous that's when I start worrying. Let me tell you about God. When I'm going through a storm and I'm biting my fingernails to the nub and I'm saying God how are we going to do it? How's it going to work out? If I just get my eyes on the Lord. He said them that, are, that have their minds stayed upon the Lord. Those are the people that are going to be blessed. Come on and say amen. But if I get my eyes on the captain of the ship, if he looks a little nervous, then maybe I should be. But let me tell you about the Lord. He ain't been caught off guard. He ain't nervous. He's not biting his fingernails. He's not losing an ounce of sleep about it. He already knew what you were going to face. He knew Friday night you'd be in the hospital. He knew that you'd go through that. But he said, it's all right. Just hang on. Hey man, I'm going to take you through this. You're going to be all right. I don't know what's up ahead, but I know who's at the helm of the ship. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who's in the driver's seat. I don't know what tomorrow's going to be like, but I know who held, who held yesterday. I know who holds right now, and I know who 
holds tomorrow in the palm of his hand and it's the Lord. Can you say amen, somebody? I don't know, but I'm feeling the Holy Ghost this morning. I want you to consider something that the Holy Ghost showed me and it has to do with marriage of two people. Anybody ever been married before? If it didn't work out, we'll talk about that later. Two people, I want you to think of this. Two people prepare to say, I do, with a multitude of unknown details. You ever thought about that? As they stand before the preacher, quivering, about to faint, hoping they can remember their their verse or their line or whatever they're going to say, their vows. While they're standing there trying to remember all that, hoping they don't pass out or cry themselves to death, they're about to say, I do, with a lot of missing details. Am I right? Some of you have been married a whole long time. There have been a lot of details you didn't know about before you got married now. Say amen. You don't know if that person that you're about to say I do is going to be unfaithful to you. Now, do you? Now, there might be a few occasions where that they say I do, knowing Roscoe's going to do that again. But anyway, you don't know whether they're going to be unfaithful to you. You don't know what's going to happen. You're hoping it's going to be all right. You don't have the details, but you're willing to say, I do. Am I right? You don't know if they're going to fall into the vices of addictions. Do you realize that in the culture that we're living in today, that addiction is one of the vices that is taking so many lives and so many precious families? Uh, I've watched people with potential to go to college and become something great and big in life. Hey man, standing on a street corner selling their body for n- next to nothing and you wonder to yourself what are they thinking because addiction takes a hold of people like that when you're about to say I do you don't know if that person you're married to is going to get caught in the vices of addiction now do you you don't know that for sure I've had times uh, I remember right here in Apopka Florida there was a young woman that had approached me at at a little gas station convenience store right off of 441 I may have shared this in the past but I pulled up I got out of the car and I heard a little voice coming down the sidewalk right by behind me and she said sir and I turned around sir and I looked and there's this beautiful woman standing there walking down the sidewalk well dressed it seemed I said yes ma'am she said can I do anything for you Lord have mercy I mean she caught me completely off guard and the first thing that came to my mind is I was so confused. What is she doing out here? And all of a sudden, the preacher kicked in. It's a good thing because I I, I would get in a lot of trouble, you know what I mean? And everybody says, am I? But in all seriousness, that I felt the Lord. And I looked at this woman and walking down the sidewalk crying out to me, Sir, sir, can I do anything for you? I said, Ma'am. I said, you mind me asking you a question? And then she looked a little bit taken back. She said, uh, uh, yeah, yes, sir. I said, what are you doing out here? She tried to dodge the question. She said, what, 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 what do you mean? I said, well, I said, I'm a preacher of a church not too far from here. And I said, uh, I know that there's something wrong. I said, but you, you don't belong out here. So what are you doing out here? Right there with cars and semi-trucks and everything buzzing right by us. Standing right there on the side of 441. She began to break down and cry. This was many years ago. And she looked at me and she said, preacher. She said, I'm so ashamed of myself. I said, well, what happened? She said, well, she said, I got into a car accident. And she said, uh, I got messed up. Up, my body all messed up and she said the doctor started giving me pain medicine and prescription pain medicine for everything and she said and so I took it and I had to take it for several months because I was in such bad shape she said I was a good housewife she said I lived in a house right over she said you know where Errol Estates is I said yes ma'am she said we, we lived in a house a $400,000 house she said I had a good career a good education 
I've got, I think she said, three or four children. Uh, she said, but I got messed up on those, uh, 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 those prescription drugs. Uh, and she said, after a little while, she said, I, uh, the doctors realized that there was something wrong. And so they, they pulled the plug and they wouldn't give me no more. And she said, my body went into withdrawals. Uh, and she said, I had made my life dependent upon those drugs. Uh, and she said, so then I started seeking out illegal drugs. Uh, and the next thing you know, uh, she got hooked up on illegal drugs. Uh, got to running with the wrong crowd. Uh, doing things and turning tricks for, amen, for people that didn't deserve her attention in the first place. Uh, and the next thing you know, as she stood there, tears running down her face, uh, crying her eyes out. She said, I lost it all, preacher. She said, my husband told me to get out. I can't deal with it no more. She said, my children won't even call me mama. I've lost it all. And now all, all I can do is walk up and down the street. Uh, I said, let me tell you something. I said, I know somebody that'll still love you and take you back here. It's the Father in heaven. Uh, but you don't know when you say I do. Come on now. You don't know uh, if that person's going to get messed up in drug addiction. You don't know uh, if you're going to face a time of foreclosure and everything you spent 25 years working for, if you're going to lose it just like that. Uh, and then it puts attention on your marriage uh, that brings your marriage almost to the point of extinction. You don't know that. Uh, and you don't know uh, if you're going to marry somebody uh, in that time frame that's going to become terminally ill. You could get five years into marriage uh, and that beautiful husband or wife uh, that you married during that time, uh, they might get in a car wreck, get maimed and messed up uh, or get so terminally ill that you got to give them a bath and change their diapers. You don't know. Uh, you don't know the details. Uh, you may go into that marriage not knowing uh, how many children you're going to have uh, or if you're even going to have children children. You don't know, but there's one thing the Holy Ghost reminded me of. You see, in all of that, something has become more important than all of those unknown details of the course of your marriage. What is it? It is love. Love says, I know there's risk and I'm missing a lot of details, but I love you enough to say I do without all the details. Some of you already know where I'm going now. Don't you love the Lord enough that if you don't have much food to eat next week uh, or if you lose that big house you've been living in uh, or you ain't even got a car to drive uh, or you lose your license uh, or you get stage 4 cancer or you get both kidneys removed uh, or you go to a place uh, that you lose all your friends because they sell you out uh, let me tell you something somebody uh, I know a God uh, who loved us enough uh, that I've got enough love for the fact that he cared for me uh, that that love says even if I don't know the details uh, I know the one who hung the sun the moon and the stars in their place somebody love the Lord like that I wonder if there's enough love in our hearts as a people to be able to have a love for the bridegroom Christ to say I love you enough that I don't have to have all the details but I'm going to tell you something it hadn't always been like that there have been times of our life where that we doubted, we questioned, and we needed to know. I need to know some things. But do I love him enough, Sister Misty? That if I don't know how it's going to work out, that I'm not going to miss a beat. I don't know if I'm going to sink a little when I step over the bow of that ship onto the top of that water. But even though I'm missing a few details, I'm going to love you, I'm going to serve you, and nothing is going to stop me. Nobody. Not the fish market. I don't care if they sell that place tomorrow. And I look over in the bed and say, what are we going to do? I'm telling you, that would be hard, wouldn't it now? So I don't know what we're going to do. So we're going to do the same thing we've been doing. There's a, there was a lot of unknowns when I said I do to the Lord and ain't nothing changed. But I'm going to serve Him anyway. Even if I don't know what I'm going to do. The devil wants you to curse God. He wants you to forget God. He wants you to walk away from God. 
But oh, that ain't what I'm going to do. How about you? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Say amen, somebody. You see, as I survey the scene and the canvas of God's holy word, I realized this morning that God has a record. He's got a track record of leaving out important details for a reason. If you survey God's word, you'll see that many times God would tell his prophets and his people the where but not the when. There were times he would tell great men of God the when but not the how. There were times he told them how but not where. Do you remember old man Noah? He didn't tell Noah the exact day that that ark's going to come to a stop. He didn't tell Noah all the details of every part and aspect of it or how long he would be in that ark. And all, but I'm going to tell you, but Noah, he built anyway. He had certain details about it that God gave him, but in case there was some missing details, it didn't cost it didn't make him stop building not one day he kept right on building for the Lord there's a song you may hear us sing every once in a while it says I'm working on a building I'm a working on a building for my Lord how many this morning you're building your own ark spiritually speaking and I'm not going to miss a day I may stumble a little here and there because of the flesh gets weak but I'm going to get up and I'm going to run again my faith may not be as strong as it one time was but I'm not going to quit. I'm going I'm to finish this race, if you agree, say amen. He didn't tell Moses the details that the Israelites' deliverance was going to include a Red Sea or a wilderness. He just let him know you're going to deliver these people. I wonder sometimes if God did give us the details, if we might say, ah, I think Brother Claypool might would rather do this one here. I, I'm going to stand out this time. <laughs> Anybody ever had anything you've done before and you thought, looking back, I'd have much rather somebody else had done that than me. <laughs> Come on now. But God didn't give Moses all the details. He didn't say you're going to come up to the Red Sea and you're going to have a whole army chasing you and nowhere to go. He didn't tell him that. But I'll tell you what, Moses loved God enough that when the day came that he did come to that Red Sea, he served the Lord anyway. He didn't tell Jacob. When Jacob wrestled all night long for the breaking of the day, for a breakthrough and the, and, and the blessing of the Lord, he didn't tell that man, hey, I just want you to know if you keep wrestling like this, you're going to wake up, you're going to get on the other side of this day, and you're going to walk around hobbling with your thigh out of joint. He didn't tell him that. No, he didn't. Somebody say, he don't always give us the details. No, he don't. He didn't forewarn the disciples that they were going to face a storm when they were, they were headed to the Gadarenes. They left one shore. They got on board the ship. Jesus said, get on board. We're going to the other side. You've heard us preach about that before. So the disciples get on board the ship, They're headed toward the Gadarenes. They don't know what's going to happen there. I believe Jesus knew that there would be a demoniac that would meet him on the shore. A man called Legion with many demons who Jesus would cast the demons out. They'd run into the swine, would run down the hill into the water and drown their cell. Jesus knew all that, but the disciples, all they heard was get in the boat, guys. We're going to the other side. There's a lot of details missing out of that. Details like what details? Like the fact that they were going to get halfway across the shore or across the sea and all of a sudden a storm was going to come down that was so great they thought they were going to die. Here's something you got to understand about the situation so you understand the gravity of how bad it really was. You're talking about people that their form of transportation was so commonly used in ships and boats and on the water that it was much like our transportation of vehicles. It was their everyday transportation. And so these are men that have been on the boat who knows how many hundreds, maybe thousands of times in the past. That'd be like Brother Coon being out on the water as much as he's been on the water his whole life. And all of a sudden, he starts getting worried. I'll tell you this much. As much as he knows about the water, if he took me on a fishing trip and he got nervous, I would start praying real bad. I really would. I mean, he'll take a fish hook and all kind of other stuff to the thumb, spear it in the back with those uh, catfish fins and everything else and if he starts getting worried out on that water he's been ran over by some idiot who was drunk ran him over with his boat ran right over top of him 
And if he started getting nervous, man, I'd be down on my knees. He'd look around. I'd be in a bed of catfish down on my knees praying, oh, God, help us right now in the name of Jesus. Come on now. I would be. Because these men, they, they understood the water, and now you got all these disciples, and they're waking Jesus up. They're like, uh, we got a problem up here. Uh, we need you right now. We, we need you. But you see, when they heard the words, get in the boat, guys, we're going to the other side, there's a lot of details missing. I guarantee you there'll be some of you like, Lord, now if we'd have known we was going to have to face a Eurocodon out on the water, if we'd have known we was about to drown and die in the middle of the ocean, headed to, to rescue a demon-possessed man, I would have said, leave me over there. Leave me back at the house. But he didn't have all the details now, did he? I want you to know something. There are some of you, you've been fretting over the details. Oh, I'm talking to somebody. I know what I feel in my spirit. But you got to have faith without the details. That's what faith is. Faith says, I'm going to trust you even though I cannot see what's ahead. Say amen, somebody. When I look at the Word of God, I understand that the patriarchs of faith that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11, they were recognized for their great faith when they pressed forward without the details. The Bible said they, they stopped the mouths of lions. They wrought righteousness and they obtained the victory and they were recognized in what some people call the, the, the hall of fame, or hall of faith, if you will, of the heroes of faith in the 11th chapter, talking about them who had great, great faith in God. He recognized them, a whole chapter dedicated to these people who had such faith. But if you go back and read their story, they press forward. In, in spite of the fact they didn't have all the details. You know, whenever the man of God, Abraham, makes that journey up the hill, he don't know there's going to be a ram in the thicket. He don't know how big that ram's going to be. He don't know when it's going to show up. He don't know. He don't have all the details. He just knows. What God said to do. Instead of sitting around biting our fingers figuratively or spiritually, we should understand that when we're faced with serious decisions, it may seem a little un unusual, a little out of the ordinary, and you may seem weird. Well, you are a little weird. Matter of fact, the Bible said you're a peculiar people. We are a little weird, at least in the world's eyes. Some of them don't understand why you'd want to go to church that much, why you, why you pray that much, why, why is all that so important. They don't understand that. We're weird to them. Don't you know what could go wrong? Yeah, I know what could go wrong. But just like it was whenever I got married, I didn't know all the details. Good thing my wife didn't know all the details. She didn't know. But as we stood there in that little log cabin church in Gate City, Virginia, where we got married, boy, that preacher, he butchered that whole thing up. Poor guy, I think he was ready to retire, poor fella. Everything. I say that in, in, in common courtesy. I almost got married to my mama that day. He said, do you, Joseph Wayne Mears, take Shirley Wayne Laldrich to be your lawfully wed? I said, no, I'm not marrying my mom, sir. But that day when we stood there, Brother Coon, getting ready to say our I do's, and we looked at each other. Boy, my wife was so pretty. She was smoking hot that day. I was looking at her and thinking, Lord, whoo, look at here. And uh, we didn't have no idea what we, was up in, what we was up against. We didn't have no kids. I didn't know that in about nine months, we were going to have a little girl. Not long after that, I didn't know we was going to have a little boy. His name was going to be Devin. One day be playing the drums in the church and calling me daddy. I didn't know. I didn't know I was going to have a little Justin. The day my wife headed to the hospital, I said, Justin needs to get just out, Lord. 
I didn't know. I didn't know that that woman that I was going to marry that was my high school sweetheart, I didn't know we'd have a lot of close calls where both of us were ready to just say, I quit and get a divorce. I didn't know. But that day that I said I do, it was because I had enough love in my heart that I felt like, you know what? If we lose that little house on 1410 Palm Avenue, if we have to sell a bunch of our stuff in a yard sale and go live in a little retirement home, a little retirement center, I ain't putting you in a home yet, a little retirement place where they got little trailers and a little bitty thing, it ain't probably about 600 square feet. We're willing to do whatever we got to do because you know what? I love you. You caught my attention, and I love you. I love you enough. My wife and I, I think it's one of the reasons why, you know, along with the fact that we love the Lord and have Him on our side, but we've said things to each other in the past like, I can't wait to grow old with you. I think the Lord heard our prayer, and the process got sped up real fast. Sometimes we'll see, like, we'd be out in public, and we see this older couple that, you know, barely can even walk, you know, and they're holding hands. I say, that's going to be us. You ever tell your husband that before? That's going to be us, baby. It's because when I said I do, I did. What about the Lord? What if, what if times get tough? What if, what if you go through 2020, and you got the coronavirus, and Riots and looting and, uh, and uh, everybody arguing and everything up in the air and everything's a mess. And what, what if you lose everything you got? I mean, is that going to change just because you didn't know the details going on? Are you going to serve the Lord anyway? Even if you prayed and you said, God, would you heal me of this? And there you are laying on that rolling bed as they roll you down the hallway and you see the ceiling tiles passing through the hallway and you know you're headed to the surgery room. Count to ten, Mr. Myers. One, two, and then I wake up in the recovery room. Did they do the surgery already? Y'all been there too, huh? I didn't know all the details. And I was hoping that I wouldn't get to that point. I told my wife yesterday, I said, you know that uh, I was supposed to already have that MRI of my head. She said, I know. But I almost don't even want to get it. But I have faith without the details. And I trust the Lord that no matter what, the same God who was there for me in the past will be the same one to be there with me today. The one who's loved me when I was truthfully not very lovable. Miranda, come play something for me and sing, if you will, this morning as we close. I knew that when God gave me this message that It will in a lot of ways apply to most everyone, but I knew that there would be specific people that this message would speak directly to them in a specific season. I don't know if you're fixing to go through something, if you're going through something now, or maybe you just came through something. And you just keep racking yourself, your brain over the fact that I just feel like if I just knew how it was all going to work out, I I would feel so much better if I just knew. There's an old saying that I have shared myself that many others have shared through the years, and it goes something like this. It says, beware of paralyzation from over analyzation what does that mean brother Myers if you're like me I I like to figure things out I mean I I 
get up in the morning, I get me a cup of coffee, and I'll, I'll sit there and I'll try to figure everything out. I don't think it all through. But like some of you, I've had places of my life where I sat down and I, I tried to figure every single detail out. And when it was all over with, I became paralyzed from being able to do what I knew or felt that God was leading me to do. And I became paralyzed because I overanalyzed every reason it won't work and how this is go wrong and if this don't work well then we just won't do nothing do you realize that right now you could be on the brink of something great but every time that God puts in your heart to do this thing you look at the numbers you look at the bills and you look at everything say ain't no way we could do it so we ain't even gonna try and you cheat yourself out of your Canaan because every time you sit down you say well I done done the budget honey and every month we'd be $175 short so it ain't going to work now listen I believe in using good judgment don't get me wrong I believe you got to use good judgment I'm, talk I'm not talking about being foolish I'm talking about people who have paralyzed their ability to take the promise maybe the thing that God has placed in front of them that God wants to do or give them and they can't ever receive it because every time he puts it in their heart, the first thing they do, they got to know all the details. You'd have never got married if you'd have known all the details probably. There's a lot of people that may have never got, took that job if you'd have known all the details. And you may have been broke sitting at the house with nothing even though you're working a job you may not even like. But you stepped out by faith without all the details. Would you stand to your feet all across the house of the Lord? Because I know, I know, I know that there's some people here this morning that need to pray and talk to the Lord. I want to challenge you in closing this morning to find a place to pray, to make a commitment to God that details or no details, I'm going to trust you through this. And I want to say one more thing that's extremely important. Those of you that are married need to hear this. It's great whenever a wife feels that way, and that's wonderful. It's great when a husband feels that way, and maybe the wife doesn't. It seems like it's okay. But husbands and wives support each other in your decisions. Stand together. What do you mean? Well, it's one thing for a wife to say, I believe God's going to bring us through this. But then whenever the husband says, no, no, wait a minute, I don't see it happening. Many times, you know what you do when that happens? You don't do nothing. And sometimes you miss out on the greatest thing God could have done for you. You need to support one another if you're married in prayer. I'm challenging you right now to find a place to make a commitment to God that details or no details, I'm going to trust you. Would you do that right now? Would you find yourself a place you could come to the altar? You say, God, details or no details, if I don't know whether or not my daughter's ever going to get saved, my son's ever going to serve the Lord. Details or no details, I'm going to keep on praying for him. The devil said, well, how can you keep being faithful to church when you got this going on and that thing happening in your life? details are none I'm going to serve the Lord and we're going to do this together we're living in a time where wives need their husbands to be strong in the Lord more than ever husbands need their wives to be faithful in the Lord more than ever the greatest thing God can do in a marriage is use both people serving the Lord to accomplish great things I want you to pray this morning I want you to talk to the Lord. Would you do that right here, right now? Would you find a place? Make that commitment between you and God. You say, Lord, details or no details. I'm going to keep on going. Details or no details, I'm going to keep preaching. I'm going to keep pastoring. I'm going to keep teaching that class. I don't know who's going to show up, but whether the details come to me or not, I'm I'm just going to be faithful. 
I'll, I'll make it through somehow with the Lord's help. I believe somebody, the Lord has spoke directly, directly, directly to your spirit. And you know God's talking to you. You should thank Him that He cared enough to deal with your heart this morning to remind you that He's, in, he's the one in control. Do you know how many victories in the Bible that would have never been won if they would have worried about the details? You know how many battles they fought that they would have never won if they'd have stayed at the house arguing over the details? You know how many prophets would have never been born and used of God if somebody would have worried and stressed and doubted over the details? You know how many churches in America would have never been built if somebody would have worried themselves over the details?